I appreciate you giving this time. I, it's, it's very flattering to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about myself, about how I came to own and operate Smith Strong, and a little bit about my biography and upbringing here in Virginia. I do think it helps explain how I got to where I am and a little bit more about myself, perhaps even more than I realized. So let me tell you a little bit more about myself and how I grew up. I was born in Goldsboro, North Carolina with a rare headwater disease called hydrocephalus. And my parents had returned there after both having grown up in Richmond to my father's family farm area just south of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And I was the eldest child. When I was born, they were devastated by the news of hydrocephalus. The doctor said I would be in a vegetative state by 17, 18 years old, and likely dead by 24. And you can understand the tears and the anguish that would have caused. The night before they were to go to the hospital for a shunt surgery to put a clear tube in the back of the head to properly drain the fluid, hydrocephalic children don't have the tubes in the back of the head and properly drain and the, the water in the back head. And so they were going the next day to the hospital to put the shun in. And they drive by this small church, uh, I believe it was called Zion Methodist, just south of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And they saw the lights on. And so they went in and they said, we'd like some prayer for this child. The pastor and other guests there in the church laid hands and prayed. And the pastor gave a word that said, this child is going to be healed. I want you to come back here and worship with us. And my parents didn't know how to take it. And they said, well, I'm not sure about that, but we just hope the surgery goes well. So they went to the hospital the next day, and they're waiting out in the waiting room anxiously with my grandparents. And this, the CAT scan was done right before the surgery, and it showed two tubes had formed at about an inch. And then they did the scan again tubes had formed at the back of the head that drains the, the head properly. Another few inches, and then another few inches. And then they could hear the water rushing out. And my parents are eagerly waiting in the waiting room. And the doctor comes out and scrubs. And my dad says, well, how did the surgery go? And he goes, well, we haven't done the surgery yet, but we'd like to keep it overnight for tests. But we don't believe the shot is still needed. And my dad said, well, you're telling me the child is healed. And he said, well, we don't know anything about that, but we do need to keep him overnight for tests. And my dad went into the operating room, popped off the various little suction cups and IV and things, and scooped me up. And they've been going to church ever since. Um, you know, growing up with that story, I always thought that I, too much is given, much is expected. And that mantra was sort of drilled into me from an early age. And I always felt keenly the obligation and responsibility that being a miracle having a miracle performed on you and having that gift of life does. And so I felt from an early age the, the calling of leadership. And certainly it was something my mother thought of me too. She always said, man, you're going to be a leader. And maybe it was just being the oldest of what became five children, but that seemed to always be the path. When I was 12 years old, I started interning with my grandmother's law firm, McGuire Woods, one of the largest, if not the largest law firm in Virginia shadowing her in the estate planning trust and tax division, really providing guidance in my career. The lawyers she worked with provided early mentorship, including to the present day. And so it was an incredible opportunity to really begin to understand, yes, I do want a career in law, and yes, this is the way forward. I remember when I was in 10th grade, having this real concern that I could end up in a factory along Jefferson Davis Highway, east of where I grew up, where it seemed all the fathers in our high school worked, either in DuPont or Philip Morris. And I remember keenly wanting to not have to work with graveyard shifts in the factory. Not that there's anything wrong with that, that life, but I just felt like I wanted more than that. But I was keenly aware that I didn't see how it was possible to get out and have that outside, a life outside of that. And so I remember thinking, gosh, I'm not the smartest kid in my class. I'm not the top. I'm not, I'm not the best athlete. So I said, you know, I'm gonna run for class president, but I had this stuttering problem. So I ran for sophomore class president and won. And that year they had tremendous race rides at our high school. And I remember during the class changes, they invited parents to come and escort their children, got so bad. 
And I remember one time I popped in the principal's office between class changes and he had locked his door. And I, I knocked on the door, he opened it, the locks it. And I sat down and I said, I'd like a pep rally to organize the school and just have them focus on something better than what's going on here. And so that began what became an almost weekly convocation, if you want to call it that, or pep rally experience for the entire high school. The first time we did it, I didn't eat dinner the night before breakfast. I was so nervous. And I'm called up to the podium and I stand there and all of a sudden the stars started falling over my eyes. And I thought I had detached my retinas or something. I couldn't see anything. And what had happened was I hadn't eaten in so long because I was so nervous that I literally was just starting to go a little blurry. Uh, at that exact moment, people started catcalling out from the crowd because this was a pretty tough school. Uh, Elsie Bird High School in Chesterfield at the time school in many ways, but a tough school nonetheless, and certainly a cross-section of life. And so here we were giving this speech, encouraging the students to be better than we were, to have a better experience than we were, and to really just try to envision what that could be like. And it became a pep rally experience meets skits and performance. It, it just really took on a life of its own and became part of the school. And it, I think it changed lives. Then I went to college at William & Mary. Uh, the summer before college, I was accepted into a program where I went to Japan for a summer. Uh, the AIG Corporation paid for it, and they chose the top 20 high school students they could find and sent them on an all-expense diplomatic tour of Japan. And so I was part of that. The following summer, after my first year at William & Mary, I helped lead the first team to set up a nonprofit in what had just ended in the war in Bosnia. So a war traumatized orphanage was there and we were there to set up a nonprofit to work with the orphans and also work with other children there. It was an incredible experience in Zenitsa, Bosnia, flying into Sarajevo in a bombed out airport. And so I began to see a broader world from Japan to Bosnia, followed by experience in Wayman Mary and where I served as class president and began working full time while maintaining a full course load, uh, working in the public affairs office. It was a hiring freeze put on the school in my last year at William and Mary. And so the intern suddenly became a director of public outreach for William and Mary. And when I graduated from William and Mary, they asked me to stay on and remain as director. And it was then that fall that I met a gentleman that invited me to go to Iraq and I served with the Department of Defense as a civilian, as a policy advisor. Baghdad, Iraq for the year between undergrad and law school. Then came law school and then working at Williams Mullet, the third largest law firm in Virginia. And then I was laid off in October of 2008, and the recession that's all too familiar to probably many of you. And I've certainly been able to relate to people that have been laid off or had job challenges over the years because of that experience. Because after being laid off, it really had, I was disoriented. I applied to other big firms because I always thought, well, I'm a big firm lawyer. And I kept getting turned down. The competition was so fierce because the economy was so bad. So then I began reading books about how to create your own firm and began looking for opportunities with it. And I saw a true need for family law, estate planning, and elder law services at a boutique family law level, and that that market was underserved. And so I had to figure out not only how to build that type of practice, but then also how to develop and design my own firm. And so I took the next three years while working at the UVA Foundation to imagine and dream up how that would look from the education of me as a manager and a business owner to me actually doing family law and estate planning work. And so that was a big change from corporate litigation before. So I took that three years while working at UVA to carefully plan that out. In 2012, February, Smith Strong began. And it's been an incredible journey, which has doubled in size every year since we've started. And it's been an incredible honor to serve Richmond and Central Virginia in family law, estate planning, and elder law. And we look forward to many great years ahead. Thanks for watching this video, and I was happy to share a little bit more about myself. And I look forward to getting to know you as you work with us. And I hope your experience here is great designed it to be client-centered, and I look forward to helping.